you also see. Good morning, everyone, to the fourth annual edition of the Interdisciplinary Workshop in Development Studies, ISDS, organized by the Center for New Economic Studies and OP General Global University. This workshop brings together scholars, domain experts, journalists, and social activists to celebrate on some of the most pressing developmental issues of our time in a workshop format panel discussion. Previous ISDS workshops organized by the center have focused on themes such as role of gender in economic development, urban transformation, a transnational perspective, acclimatized emergencies, amongst others. The workshops have featured, featured experts and scholars from esteemed institutions such as the SOAS, UCL, the London School of Economics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi School of Economics, and social organizations such as Red Art, India, Begam, and the Sochi Foundation. The 2021 edition of ISDS workshop will introduce the Access Inequality Index, AEI, which measures inequality across states and union territories in India, followed by panel discussions on various themes in the index. The index aims to provide an in-depth assessment of each Indian state's performance in ensuring access to basic social and economic services. The workshop consists of three panel discussions. The first panel discussion titled Access to Inequality in India, an analytical study for states across India, will introduce and reflect on the report published and have a look at the performance of states based on different paradigms. The second panel cycles Frontiers of Digitalization, Possibilities and Limitations from an Access Prism will discuss the potential and limitations of digitalization in building inclusive societies. The last panel titled Conceptualizing Access to Inequality, Moving Forward with AEI, will have panelists from across sectors discussing and analyzing the role of the index in the future. Today, we are delighted to have with us Professor R. Sudarshan, the Dean of Jindal School of Government and Public Policy. He has held distinguished careers in the domain of research, development programming, and governance. In 1984, he served in the Ford Foundation's South Asia office in New Delhi as Assistant Representative and Program Officer for Human Rights and Social Justice. In 1991, he joined the UNDP in India as Senior Economist and Assistant Representative of governance and public policy. In 2012, he joined the OP Jindal Global Dean TV University as the founding dean of the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy. He has an impressive track record of publications comprising books, articles, and UN policy reports, reflecting his interdisciplinary research, teaching, and policy experience in development programs, human development, law, governance, institutions, and policy. We also have with us Dr. Indrani Mukhopadhyay, who is an associate professor at OP Jindal Global University. He teaches public health, health economics, comparative health systems, and development econ economics at the School of Government and Public Policy. Dr. Mukhopadhyay has 15 years of research and teaching experience in the area of health economics and healthcare financing. He's held several research studies funded by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, World Health Organization, and several international and national publications to his credit. He is also the co-editor of the Jindal Journal of Public Policy. We also have with us Mr. Mangalam Kesavan Veni, who is the founding editor of The Wire, a news website published by the Foundation for Independent Journalism, a non-profit Indian company he has over 30 years of experience in journalism and has worked with several leading Indian publications, including the Hindu and Hindustan Times. Prior to The Wire, he was with The Economic Times, where he was the opinion editor and wrote a regular column for the editorial page. He also hosts a discussion called The State of the Economy on Rajya Sabha Television, a parliamentary TV channel of the Upper House of the Parliament of India. We also have with us Dr. Siddhi Gyan Pandey, who has completed her PhD in economics from the Center for Economic Studies and Planning, Jawaharlal Nehru University in 2019. She's completed her MA and MPhil in economics from JNU and BA in economics from Sriram 
College of Commerce, Delhi University. Her research involves game theoretical analysis of network interaction and social network formation. Her teaching interests lie within the areas of microeconomics, game theory, mathematics and statistics for social sciences and networks economics. At Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, she teaches the foundational quanti quantitative skills courses along with economics. I would now like to hand over the floor to Professor Dipanshu Mohan. All right, uh, very good morning to one and all. Um, I would like to start by saying that the idea to plan this workshop today and the date for it was largely influenced by the fact that it is uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, birth anniversary. It's on the occasion of Gandhi Jayanti, we felt that uh, there was perhaps no better occasion to release um, the study with, which, which sort of uh, in its conceptual design draws upon uh, a lot of its ideas from Gandhi's own economic philosophy and so does from, from Ambedkar's uh, thought process. Um, in defining his economic philosophy, Gandhiji once said, uh, my idea of society, uh, and I quote, my idea of society is that while we are born equal, meaning that we have a right to equal opportunities, all have not the same capacity. It is in the nature of things impossible. For instance, all cannot have the same height or color or degree of intelligence. Therefore, in the nature of things, some will have ability to earn more and others less. People with talents will have more and they will utilize their talents for this purpose. If they utilize their talents kindly, they will be working or they will be performing the work for the state. Such people exist most often as trustees or no other terms. I would allow a man or a woman of intellect to earn more. I would not cramp his talent or her talent but the bulk of his or her greater earnings must be used for the good of the state, just as the income of all earning sons and daughters uh, of father go to the common family fund. They would have their earning only as trustees. For I want to bring about an equalization of status. The working classes have all these centuries been isolated and relegated to a lower status. They have been shudras and the word has been interpreted to mean an inferior status. I want to allow no differentiation between the son or the daughter of a beaver, of an agriculturalist and of a schoolmaster." End of quote. At the core of Gandhi's economic reasoning and economic philosophy, the idea to create equal access of social and economic opportunities to all people, despite their status in a given society, was central to securing the economic development of a society as a whole. Ambedkar's views too in this regard were similar. Maybe one of those rare things where the two saw convergence in thought and action. We can surely debate on how can the state or a society through other institutions make this happen. But any discourse on studying or understanding the degree of inequality and its measurement from the perspective of incomes alone, whether observed under a global or a national lens, says very little about the actual inequalities or inequities that people experience and live with. There has been a pressing need to incorporate a more interrelational perspective in the development of a granular meso-level approach to inequality studies, as argued by scholars like Amar Sen, Martha Nussbaum, and many others, which would complement and align with macro findings, both in terms of measurement and analytical scrutiny. Our center has done this so far by employing ethnographic anthropological tools to study core socioeconomic issues from a grassroots community level. And our quest to be focused on issues affecting the most vulnerable amongst India's workforce have taken us to different corners of the country, particularly so over the last uh, two years. That quest in inquisition still remains. We will continue to document, archive, and analyze the state of being of the invisibilized in the effort to bring out their voices in any ways possible. Access Inequality Index is also a step in that direction. The method though is different. The index should serve as a mirror in times to come for states across India to measure their performance of development, not simply through indicators that show how much foreign capital is invested in the state or how much growth 
in GSDP terms is increasing their growth performance, but also measure to get a sense as to what extent their own state populations have access to basic social and economic opportunities that subsequently make them capable to grow, evolve, and perceive better as beings of today and tomorrow. This is also vital for invoking and expanding the civic consciousness of India's citizenry across states. Though the word access in general means a lot of things, it means a way of approaching, reaching, or entering a place as the right or opportunity to reach, use, or visit, it's here broadly conceptualized to encompass four A's of four forms of access. My fellow team members will briefly discuss this in a while from now when they present the report <clears throat> findings. What we want to do is to see that in the analytical framework of this index, there are five fundamental pillars of assessment where states across India and union territories are ranked. We rank them on the basis of performance in each of these pillars, access to education, access to healthcare, access to basic amenities, access to socioeconomic security and access to justice. Our report also delves deeper into the existing gaps within access performance observed across different segments of our population based on the area of residence, the divide between the rural and urban, caste groups and gender. More detailed findings of our report will be presented by the author team, as I said, in a while from now. But before that, I would like to invite our school's dean, uh, Kathleen Modrowski, to say a few words on our observations from the team's work. I must add that the unconditional support received in producing this index work, given the current uh, social and political climate, along with the creative freedom that we have enjoyed, couldn't have been possible without the dean and the vice chancellor's support. I would also like to especially thank our mentors, Indranilda, Anamika, for guiding us throughout the process of working in producing this index, I'd like to thank our fellow authors, Latika, Richa, Vanshika, and Advaita, the designers and editors, Shiri Sharma, Rekha Pachori, team organizers, Vyonana, Ada, Prashanu, and more importantly, our IT and AV team for giving their time on a national holiday. Um, off to you, uh, Dean. Hey. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank everyone for the opportunity to read the report, which I found was really exciting. Um, I started out thinking maybe this was going to be boring, but when I looked at it, I saw what happens as I'm reading it, it leaves me with a whole set of questions. And I think any kind of index or report, uh, that's what they should, it should lead to is the questions that you're asking, certainly about the disparities, the inequalities in various uh, states in India. One thing that struck me is, you know, coming from the United States is if I'd look at this kind of a chart and I would be able to say, they'd say Georgia is lacking, the state of Georgia is lacking in education and healthcare. I have a whole baggage of, of history, of events, of social structure, of migrations that come to mind without having to do much research. Whereas when I look at Goa, when I look at Madhya Pradesh, and I see the two different ends of comparison, I want to hear more. Uh, I want to hear the why. I want to hear the historical, socio, economic background, uh, also understanding more about the human settlement of the region and the movement. So this is, you know, as you mentioned there, uh, Dupancho, there's a lot of work being done as far as using ethnographic means to discover the why. But one of the real values of this report that I see is, um, and I certainly hope it gets wide dissemination, uh, is having people who are responsible in the state and the members of that state, the citizens as well, looking at the comparison and asking these questions. I like the idea very much that you've combined it with some of the points of opportunities and then the capability structure as well, that approach uh, was 
you know, very interesting for me to see how it is applied rather than just separately. Uh, usually you get an economic report, you get the income, and then you do not get the other nuances that really come from it if you're going to use something like capabilities, which is all important. I think we're seeing a shift in it. Uh, I would say again, one of uh, besides Nussbaum and Sen's work on it, I also think that, you know, looking at uh, the, the other ways of, again, using ethnographic material is very important and getting the opinion of people who are part of the state's members, the citizens, to have them be part of a cooperative kind of collaborative look at what the results are in these approaches. Uh, I like the use of, as I said, the five pillars. I think, you know, that's extremely useful. As a research tool, uh, I would highly recommend this. Being able to see it, being able to analyze it, and I think you're gonna have much greater discu a discussion of these points when you have the individual breakout session and reports from the people who are working on these areas. One part that um, I do question is, I feel while you do include gender, I think gender is so important it ought to be cross-cutting in everything. And I would recommend a, a closer integration of issues like gender in everything you do. And uh, also gender coming from people who are, as you emphasize, the voiceless and the invisible in that society. So I think you have to rethink some of the categories that you're using for you know, measuring gender. You, you mentioned in the description, for example, on education, something that's very dear to me, is uh, you know, use of certain criteria for measuring education in countries. You talk about uh, definitely, you know, toilets is something that we know extensive studies were done in Carnell and elsewhere showing uh, the increase in women, in young women in education had to do uh, with uh, private toilets for girls. And also the idea of, um, I think you mentioned this reporter it was another one, uh, transportation. So, you know, introduction of transportation for uh, young women by giving bicycles to people in different sectors. So I think the transformative areas that are hinted at, but have to be further explored uh, in this report are something that's really important. The other area that surprised me was uh, access to justice. And when I saw access to justice, I saw that police and judges were two areas that were measured. But my own work around the campus here in some of the villages are, those are probably the least relied upon systems of justice, you know? And uh, that one of the, the highlights of Haryana's justice system, of course, is the all women's police station which is never used by women who it was destined to be used by. It's just not, uh, it's something that's for a different class. So going into, you know, more into caste and religious uh, ideas or indicators, I think is very, very important because there are all the built-in prejudices. And as you indicate, you know, this is, again, the indicators lead to questions. And I think that's one of the most important thing is the questions that arise from these uh, issues. Also, I was interested in, you uh, mentioned, your team does in the explanation of the report, the effect of COVID. I just think this is going to be an ongoing uh, part that's going to upend some of the statistics and the value of having these uh, this basis of the indicators is going to be that we'll be able to measure the change that's happening so rapidly and that we still don't have the end point uh, coming in yet. 
So I'll just close in saying I agree wholeheartedly that this is a very important survey. It's a very important tool. Uh, I think a user's guide to the tool would be really good too. I'm looking at from a university perspective and saying, you know, allowing faculty and students and other researchers and other um, agencies, what's the best way to do it? So I think, you know, providing a, a really hefty user's guide and it would be something good. And then you do mention uh, very pointedly in your concluding remarks about this, that actually it is a work and it is a continuous work and it is a continuous work in progress. You say it must be a continuous exercise, allowing for longitudinal comparison of states and access their performance relative to uh, others over a period of time. So, you know, that's really important too, because I think the weight of comparison, um, the sense of competition based on comparison is very important. And if it is used, as you all indicate, not as the finality, but as a starting point in working toward meaningful social change and breaking down uh, and identifying inequalities, that's a wonderful contribution. So thank you very much uh, for doing this. And I really look forward to seeing the continuous work. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Kathleen. I mean, those were uh, very insightful observations. In fact, the next step for us in the foundation of the work will be to look more deeply at social composition. Um, we had some serious limitations with respect to access to data when we were trying. I mean, gender was one of our key uh, metrics of comparison across all pillars. And so was technology, even I think the access to digital technology, which in itself has, uh, is a gender enabling or empowering tool has that, that effect. But we were uh, at the stages of initially looking at open databases and public uh, sources, uh, there, were, there were some limitations that we were facing. But I think the next step for us in the annual work would be to build upon this, look at it more from a social composition uh, base, not just look at gender, but caste, class, and other factors. Access to justice, I mean, this is a point which was three years, four years made, and Richard would recall this, about why have we looked at, for example, police and, and uh, courts. Because metric, from a metric evaluative point, uh, unfortunately, they, there's this tendency to only look at institutional infrastructure. But I think there are more ways, because more from an ethnographic perspective, this is something which is a challenge that we face because we want to go in and look and understand the you know the multifaceted nature of contexts that are competing against each other in in defining the restrictions to access right um but thank you so much ma'am for this and we we'll, we we'll look forward to sort of work and revise uh, and and update uh, our work i do want to take this opportunity before i give the floor to our uh, fellow authors to uh, sort of thank and also have um, if I can you know, just maybe very quickly share my screen. Is it visible? To also thank um, our dear student organizers who put phenomenal amount of work and effort in uh, making this possible. And in the presence of Dean Kathleen and Dean Sudarshan, I want to take this opportunity to please uh, maybe just virtually, you know, sort of congratulate each of the student organizers. So uh, if that's all right with you, ma'am, we'll just take a very quick a few minutes to acknowledge the work that our journal team has put in making this workshop possible. Uh, it took a lot of work, months of planning, and uh, Ada Nagar, uh, who has uh, been phenomenal in her work within the center, um, she was one of the you know, uh, principal team members organizing this. So has been Bionana Fernandez. Um, so just maybe just a congratulations to all of them. Um, uh, Krishanu Kashyap, uh, again, a research analyst for the center. They have been uh, doing a lot of good work with the nickel and dime team. Uh, and the authors of the report um, who have been, uh, you know, working <laughs> very, very hard. And, you know, it's, uh, I was saying this to the team that this, this sort of work, which looks at a pan India uh, body of, of databases and streaming through 
like so many numbers coming in it took a lot of time filtering out and uh, just wanted to sort of thank and acknowledge the work of richa uh, who works with the center she's been there since the very inception uh, over the last five and a half to six years the very first project we did with street vendors in delhi uh, she helped us conceptualize and design the study uh, so thank you richa uh, you can see and hear us uh, latika who uh, has been contributing as a senior research analyst for this project she works with kpmg um and wanted to associate herself on a project within the center and this was maybe her calling uh, for for taking a lot of time uh, from her end uh, while managing her maternity leave so i think she 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 sort of you know took a lot of time from from her household responsibilities as well and you know at that time vanshika mittal uh, phenomenal work uh, i mean in fact i sort of give a lot of the work on the labor of looking through databases to both vanshika and advaita uh, they have worked for months across the summer in fact during the second wave uh, and the impact of the second wave as it was sort of now breaking for all of us they were sort of looking at databases day in and day out to keep their mind occupied with this so uh, thank you all and now i would like to give the floor to latika maybe uh, you should uh, start with the presentation and we will then uh, get the panelists to get, get involved um dean kathleen i am aware that we have a prayer meeting for one of our students who uh, passed away recently so ma'am please exercise your discretion as and when you feel that you need to leave thank you thank you i will find but i'd like to listen to a bit of thank it you, it's so interesting thank you very much thank you so much uh, the panchu and uh, uh, ma'am kathleen and a very good morning to everyone taking forward the presentation i would like to uh, begin with uh, the contents of the whole presentation has already been discussed by the panchu so i'll quickly move forward towards highlighting the need or the answer to why this index so um, we know that the rising debate on income inequality as also earlier mentioned by our speakers that the importance of being clear on how inequality is measured and understood becomes very important we've seen that the focus has been largely on inequality of outcomes uh, and measured often through lorentz curve of the unique coefficient decile ratios and others which you know uh, generally measure income or wealth inequality uh, but the literature on e inequality of opportunities is rising in the past few years as well so in addition to this when we keep the sustainable development goals in the background which aims to ensure that there's no one is left behind and aiming at reducing inequality globally uh, we see that one of the major factors of uh, why india is falling short of achieving these goals remains under investment in human and social capital which leads to uneven access to various opportunities this with the goal of achieving in equality of opportunities rather than outcomes it becomes very important to measure inequality from this perspective putting to this we know that global data shows that uh, covid-19 pandemic has further widened the uh, income and wealth inequalities across uh, within the and between countries and thus pandemic has not only contributed to inequality but it has also changed the dynamics of the public service delivery the working of institutions be it government or private markets and thus measuring inequality from a fresh perspective to uh, take this dynam dynamism into account becomes very vital and uh, in an era where we have social distancing and requires minimal contact um, going beyond physical access and looking at other nuances of access becomes is very important thus the objective of the report are threefold one is that we are create we have created a multi dimensional index to capture inequality of what that is what we are looking where is the inequality within the axis of the key opportunities second we are looking at inequality of whom or horizontal inequality as uh, highlighted by the panchu that we are looking at gender we are looking at caste we are also looking at where the person belongs and thirdly we are uh, looking very briefly on the impact of pandemic because the data which is present right now is very less and uh, also not available across the states so we have qualitatively briefly touched upon the impact of pandemic as well 
So now coming to uh, the core of the paper or the core of the report, which is access. What do we mean by access? So it is just not uh, saying that, okay, uh, how far or, you know, uh, just looking at the physical uh, or the special distribution, but we are looking at the four A's, which defines the ease or uh, the opportunity itself, uh, which is available to individual to use the essential service or the institution. So four A's are availability, which uh, looks at the physical access, whether the service is available or not. Secondly is approachability, which means geographical access, how far or how near is, um, uh, uh, is the service or the institution. Uh, thirdly, affordability, which is the financial access. So for example, if we say that um, uh, uh, going to a hospital or accessing healthcare services is too expensive, which India has one of the highest out-of-pocket expenditure and the one of the least uh, health insurance coverage, we know that it becomes inaccessible to a citizen to uh, the healthcare uh, service uh, to take uh, benefits of the healthcare services. Thus, it becomes an important nuance to look at. Um, fourth is appropriateness, which captures various dim uh, various uh, sub-dimensions such as timeliness, how effective or adequate is the service, and what is the quality. Um, just to give you an example, we know that um, uh, it's often said justice um, delayed is justice denied. So in the pillar of access to justice, is we have seen we have taken indicators like pendency of the cases uh, which marks the timeliness of the service and that defines that whether in true sense the service is available is accessible to the person or not so given that uh, SDGs and even uh, the government's target of Sabka Saat and Sabka Vikas, uh, given that they target on universal access to various opportunities, uh, this report examines that how far the Indian states and the UTs are in reaching or in providing the universal access to the essential goods and service. And we look at imbalances or the um, distribu unequal distribution of the deprivations from uh, the supply side. And we have not uh, looked at the demand side uh, dimensions such as acceptability from the citizen side, whether what is their perception, because uh, this would require a different, um, a, a very in-depth uh, survey at an individual level, um, which uh, maybe we can cover in our uh, next versions of the report. Uh, but due to yes. the uh, lack of data, we have kept uh, the definition of access to the supply side. So moving forward on giving you a picture of a consolidated picture of what the framework and the index is that we have covered a multi-dimensional framework because in general, when we look at a single dimension or one dimensional income based measurements such as Lorentz curve or Guinea curve, they do not reflect the inequality of opportunity that arise because of the factors or the circumstances that are beyond individual's control and which for which they cannot be Health uh, uh, responsible. So um, the the index measures five key pillars, which is basic amenities, which has water, sanitation, housing, clean energy, nutrition, and very important in today's era, digital access, which is mobile or internet with the citizens. Then we have access to healthcare. We look at uh, the rural healthcare, how affordable it is, and especially focusing on the maternal and the childcare health as well. Access to education is our next pillar, which uh, looks at secondary education, particularly because uh, achievement of uni uh, elementary education has been almost reached uh, to a universal stage. Our uh, next pillar is access to socioeconomic security, and then we cover access to justice. So overall, we have the whole index has 58 indicators, which have been uh, put into 23 categories. And each of them relate to an important opportunity, uh, uh, which is crucial to social and human development. And it improves the overall quality of life. In uh, the, uh, the capabilities term, these are the they build important capabilities uh, for an individual. Now quickly uh, coming to uh, how this index was calculated uh, is uh, we have taken the equal weights uh, and a simple average aggregation technique, which is also used in many global indices such as human development index. And uh, sorry, each of the five pillars have been uh, uh, 
we have for them each of the five pillars we have calculated the sub indices using aggregation through arithmetic mean and uh, as you can see on the screen we have the formula which uses the min and max and that is how the index scores have been calculated for each of the key five key pillars and then we take the geometric mean for the composite index for all of the five um, sub indices which are available so uh, if we have if uh, we can take this in detail uh, further in the questions if uh, anyone is interested in picking up how uh, is the detailed uh, methodology or uh, the computation so moving on to uh, the findings from the index uh, and uh, looking for the answers to inequality or equality of what we first present the findings of our composite index uh, the composite index is uh, as i uh, mentioned that uh, the sub indices of each of the five pillars are aggregated to arrive at the final composite score and the whole range of the index lies between 0.67 which is highest uh, and is for goa and 0.23 which is the least index score and we have grouped the states based on their scores um into three categories front runners achievers and aspirants so put putting a positive note to all the, uh, the to the performance of all the states the front runners uh, have the index uh, score as the top one for <coughs> and uh, we have see, we have seen that uh, smaller states like goa sikkim himachal pradesh they make the cut to top 5 uh, but also that these governments have ensured to improve even their human development um, uh, uh, index so they are also uh, very highly placed in the human development index uh, scores which generally uh, focuses on outcomes so there is a, a relation between um, uh, Uh, the state government's efforts in uh, human development as well as sustainable development uh, uh, goals and uh, ensuring that they have the best access uh, to uh, basic amenities health and other opportunities um, across for their citizens so second is achievers which have the median uh, uh, the average scores and aspirants are to say that uh, perform the least uh and we see that these states require a lot of effort to improve the access now uh this was the comparison within the states but if we look at okay what is the inequality in we see that the highest inequality persists in the access to basic amenities so access to basic amenities is what comprises of your uh an extended version of roti kapda makan which is uh, your food housing um you, know, you have uh, uh digital access which is very important access to mobile phones and internet you also have clean fuel the lpg access uh, uh which also matters a lot in today's sustainability environment uh and then we have uh, pipe drinking water and sanitation as the part of access to basic amenities so there is a huge inequality among the states in this particular pillar which is followed by uh, access to justice healthcare and then social economic security the least variations or the least unequal uh, pillar which we have is access to secondary school education so that is uh, uh, the bright side of the picture um now we'll move to the sub indexes uh, some in sub indices which is for each of the pillar and we will see that uh, what each pillar uh, comprises of and how are, how the states perform and within each pillar what are the inequalities like uh, so uh, uh, vanshika over to you thank you latika the first pillar that we'd be looking at is the access to basic amenities the table on the slide lays out a total of 10 indicators across the dimensions as latika has already mentioned clean water sanitation housing clean cooking fuel nutrition and digital access column 3 particularly is interesting since it maps since it indicates the access dimension covered as mentioned earlier the four a's under each of the indicators i'll be explaining this mapping with the example of sanitation so whether a household or an individual has access to a toilet or not comes under the availability of sanitation to understand its use or functionality we need to gauge whether the toilet is re maintained regularly and cleaned properly which is done through the access of access to water for use in the toilets we can move to the next slide most basic amenities have government programs running to ensure complete coverage within the country 
these include pradhan uh, pradhan mantri avas yojana public distribution service household individual household lakshmi under bharat abhiyan jal jeevan mission ujwal scheme and national digital communications policy efficient implementation within smaller geographical areas contribute to the fact that on average smaller states have an advantage and lie above larger states in their rankings this can be seen since the front runners mainly be goa punjab kerala sikkim haryana and mizoram are mainly the smaller states of the nation this could also be the reason behind the lowest score of the union territories in this case dadra and nagar haveli being above 0.3 while the lowest score for states in this case jharkhand is at a 0.19 can move to the next slide the table here marks the disparities among states and the lack in universal access some key findings of the pillar are the largest disparity among the states and lack in achieving universal access lies in access to water which is the most fundamental of all human needs it's marked in red in the table moving to housing while as large as 83% of all households in our country live in pakka houses of these only 46% come under the category of good houses by nsso even for the top 5 front runners the average of pakka houses is at 95% of which only 59% are categorized under good condition while the table shows the disparity between the states is the least in digital access please note that its all india average is the second lowest this highlights the urgency to look into this aspect despite the many government schemes already running under this next slide yeah Adhra, hi everyone so um, beyond being an integral part of decent living standards good health is also essential for human capital development so in evaluating the access to healthcare we consider indicators for reproductive healthcare medical expenditures physical infrastructures of hospitals and beds etc so we have taken a total of 13 indicators uh, mostly from nfhs reports and ministry of health and family welfare and also rural health statistics next slide please our data indicates that the front runners are goa tamil nadu sikkim and kerala while the worst performing states include nagaland assam jharkhand and bihar one explanation could, for this could be high public expenditure Goa and Sikkim are few of the top ranking states when it comes to per capita expenditure on public health care. Meanwhile, Bihar and Jharkhand are some of the lowest ranking ones. However, this is only one part of the picture. Within the states, Goa and Kerala top the ranks when it comes to antenatal care and even postnatal care for that matter. These are areas where Nagaland is severely lagging behind. This is a cause of concern as our data shows that the lack of access to health care for marginalized groups is most pronounced for maternal health care hence women from sc st and obc backgrounds tend to have more issues accessing the needed reproductive health care services uh next slide please thank you in exploring the interstate inequality we know that some indicators have higher state wise distribution than others the number of hospital beds in public hospitals display the greatest standard deviation lakshadweep is the best performing state in this indicator with 4.41 beds per 1000 people In contrast, Chandigarh and Bihar are the worst performers, with around 2.5 beds per 1,000 people. We also know that most states are far below the mandated SDG target and the global benchmark of three beds per 1,000 people. In fact, only one UT meets this benchmark, which is Lakshadweep. Moving on to institutional births, the percentage of deliveries in healthcare institutions also has diversity in coverage across the country, with the national average being 78.9. Pondicherry is the best performer with 99.9% coverage. Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Lakshadweep also do very well in this sector. In contrast, we know that the northeastern northeastern states like Nagaland, Meghalaya, and Arunachal Pradesh severely struggle in this area. Next slide, please. The next pillar is access to education. This includes 11 indicators across the dimensions of school, teaching staff, vocational training and digital infrastructure. Please note that the index uses secondary education as the level to measure access to education, which is to say that all the indicators laid out in the table have been taken at the secondary level of education. This has mainly been decided due to the high enrollment and turnout rates already achieved 
already achieved in elementary education in the country. High performances in several indicators lead to Punjab topping the sub-index. This is due to several reasons. Firstly, 99% of Punjab schools have functional girl toilet facilities, which reflects in the fact that in 2019, Punjab reported zero dropout rates for girls at the secondary level. Even overall, dropout rate in the state is at the lowest and enrollment is at the highest. Next slide. While enrollment rates have been increasing, several factors such as affordability and gender bias prevent certain sections of the population from accessing schools, which is why along with enrollment rates, it is very necessary to look at the attendance ratios in these states. Least attendance ratios have been reported in Meghalaya and Uttar Pradesh in states and Daman and Diu and Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the UTs. An interesting find of this pillow was that Chhattisgarh, Assam, Odisha, Bihar and Jharkhand have the lowest average expenditure per student on secondary education. While on one hand, this reflects on the affordability of education, there is also evidence that this figure is highly correlated with the per capita income of the state. Once again, the All India average in terms of digital access is very low. This is very concerning in the context of the pandemic where education has been imparted primarily through digital means. Up until now, we've seen that both schools and households in our nation are not sufficiently equipped, creating a larger gap due to remote learning. Next slide. Next, we move on to the access to socioeconomic security. This slide details the eight indicators used in this pillar that are largely clubbed under economic, financial, and social security. Social protections have not received enough attention from the government, keeping in mind that public expenditure reported under this exclusive of healthcare is only a 1.5% of the GDP. Next slide. As can be seen, Goa outperforms every other state result which, sorry, Goa outperforms every other state in all the indicators, resulting in a large gap between the shown index scores. Meanwhile, union territories do not have a large disparity in the scores. The lowest performing states in this in pillar are Jharkhand, Assam, Uttar Pradesh, and Bihar. Next slide. Bank accounts available on a household level have the lowest disparity among states. This has mainly been achieved under the Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana, where almost all states have achieved the universal target, except for a few such as Manipur and Jammu and Kashmir. According to the SDG 3.0 report, there are only 12 banking outlets and 17 ATMs per 1 lakh population in the country as of September 2020. This shows just how unapproachable access to financial services are in India. Even, with, even within these low averages, ATMs per 1 lakh population has the largest inequality among states and UTs. Northeastern states, Northeastern states such as Mizoram, Nagaland, Meghalaya, and Manipur, along with Goa, provide the highest access to rural employment under Manarega when demanded. While this reflects that Manarega helps the extremely poor fight poverty, it's, their working conditions are concerning when less than 50% of the working population in India in the non-agricultural sector is covered under any form of social security benefits. Even insurance schemes, including both life insurance and employee state insurance, have very low penetration all across the nation. Goa, a top performer in the employee state insurance, has only 26% of its employees covered. Next slide. Uh, the next pillar that we're discussing is access to justice. When discussing justice, it is important to note that it refers to the four measurable public instruments of judiciary, prisons, legal aid, and police, which are essential in maintaining law and order. Hence, we've taken indicators such as vacancies in police and high court judiciary, prison occupancy, and the number of inmates per officer. We've also looked at the average number of villages covered under some form of legal aid clinic. This is particularly important since legal aid clinics make justice accessible and affordable to the rural population after the National Legal Services Authority. We've used reports like the India Justice Report, Indian Crime Report, and also data from the National Judicial Data Grid. 
Next slide, please. Sikkim and Nagaland top our rankings when it comes to justice, while Meghalaya and Uttarakhand have the lowest sub-index scores. This can be largely attributed to the fact that Sikkim and Nagaland do particularly well in physical infrastructure and human resources. However, state size might also play a role. Next slide, please. Starting with the efficiency of police services, we know that an, at an all India level, there is a problem of understaffing. Population per police person at an all India averages at 712, well above the recommended ratio of 450.5. There are major inequalities at the state level further. In states like Bihar and West Bengal, there is one police person for around 1,200 to 1,500 people. These lack of resources are also reflected in the number of police stations per 1,000 population. Both Bihar and West Bengal lie the lowest in police stations for the given population. Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh do very well in this area. Moving on to judiciary, the vacancy of high court judges is as low as 8.3 in Sikkim to as high as 70.3 in Andhra Pradesh. This has resulted in an astronomical caseload per judge for poor performing states. We know that the lower the population load on a high court judge, the better the state rankings are. While understaffing in the judiciary is a major concern, a greater cause of concern is the lack of representation. On average, Indian states have 10% women judges. Bihar, Uttarakhand, and Manipur have 0% female high court judges. The lack of gender representation in the judiciary not only impacts the direction of many verdicts, but also restricts the avenues of employment for women in the sector. Next slide, please. Can you see my screen, sorry? Yes. Okay. Uh, so... Now we have seen that uh, uh, what, where was the inequality in terms of uh, the various indicators and the pillars which we have taken. Moving forward to a very crucial part of the report, which is inequality of whom, as uh, we, uh, we need to know that across the individual or the characteristics which the individual has in terms of gender or caste, which is very important for India, and also where the person resides is uh, an important indicator is a perspective to look at, especially when it comes to inequality. So um, in India, the discourse uh, on the divide between Bharat and India is not new. Around 65% uh, six, uh, of Indian population still live in Indian villages. Um, and in totality, the access to opportunity and opportunities and the resources has a clear special dimension and divide and people in the rural area are worse off than in urban population across all the states. If, for example, if you look at basic amenities, we see that um, in terms of the sufficiency in availability of drinking water, there is quite a, a reach towards universal access. But when we look at approachability or appropriateness by looking at indicators of pipe drinking water uh, in the premises of the household, we see that there is a wider disparity in the rural and the urban areas. People residing in the urban areas have relatively higher access to unshared and quality by which we mean that there is availability of water in the toilets um, that is uh, seen across majority of the states. In terms of housing also, we see that more people have pakka house, uh, access to pakka houses in the urban areas than in rural areas. And looking at the uh, very important part where uh, we have uh, digital access, we see that 31% of the rural population has in, uh, is they are internet users, but 65% of the urban uh, population on the other hand are internet users. So there is a stark uh, inequality between the usage of the internet uh, between rural and urban population, but this inequality is a bit lesser when it comes to the use of mobile phones. So mob the, there is a, a, a ubiquity in uh, using of the mobile phones in this uh, age, which is a positive sign. Uh, when we come to healthcare, there are asymmetries between rural and urban India, mainly because of the predominance of the private healthcare, which uh, adds to the cost of uh, um, uh, medical expenditure in the for the households. So there is higher concentration.
concentration of private healthcare providers in the urban areas, and uh, therefore we see the disparities. In the rural areas, uh, the mobile technology and the improved data services they are they are they are expected to play a critical role um, in pro providing or improving healthcare services but there needs to be a lot of work in this area uh, the national digital health mission of the government is still in its nascent stage and we need uh, to see a lot more implementation there uh, the shortfalls in the access to healthcare uh, is indicated uh, by the required number of the beds or accessibility to the equipments even availability of the doctors and the medical staff. And this has been highlighted during the worst hit times of the pandemic. And we have seen the dismal state of the Indian healthcare system, especially uh, for the rural populations. And um, in terms of uh, overall uh, access to justice, uh, uh, and other pillars like financial and economic security, we see that it is skewed against the individuals residing in the rural parts of the in, uh, uh, of the country. Uh, say, for example, uh, as uh, Dean Kathleen already mentioned, that the access to ports or the police stations, um, are, uh, since they are situated in the urban areas, as well as uh, affordability of the lawyers, advocates, etc., they add to the cost of accessing justice to the rural population, and thus makes it less. Uh, accessible or there is more inequality which is observed there uh, because of the fact that where they are residing. Um, the uh, employment opportunities, uh, uh, there is uh, disparities in terms of the social security coverage, not only access, but the quality of the decent work as well. And uh, um, the how much uh, financial uh, services are available to them. Now moving on to a very important uh, part again, which is the caste. Uh, we know that uh, uh, as per the NFHS survey, uh, around 45% of the ST population lies in the lowest bracket uh, income or wealth bracket compared to 27% of the SC population and 18% of the OB, uh, OBC population. So there is a skewed distribution of wealth and income which coexist with the inequalities in the access to opportunities, allocation of resources and availability of social capital for the Indian social structure. SC, ST, and OBC households, they lag behind in general uh, as per the findings of the report in overall socio-economic development because of unequal access to the opportunities. For instance, if we see that marginalized caste groups, uh, SC, ST, OBCs are not allowed to access the same water resources, for example, wells and community stand posts um, uh, by the dominant caste groups in, in many rural parts of India. And these are based on the orthodox social beliefs, which creates a barrier to the access to many of the basic amenities to the households. So since caste, we have seen that how uh, inequality exists for various caste groups, moving on to gender, which is uh, one of the greatest barriers to human development. And it uh, is reflected in the disadvantaged access to the opportunities uh, towards development. So across all states, we have seen that both in rural and urban areas, there are fewer women uh, in the workforce uh, compared to men. So if, when we're talking about access to work first, we can see that uh, there are uh, fewer women. Uh, in uh, rural areas, we know, uh, we've seen that um, uh, there is the, the worker population ratio uh, is 19, uh, uh, is 19, whereas 52 for the males. And in urban sector, we see that there are 40, the WPR or the worker population ratio is 14.5 for females and 52.7 for males. So overall, not even a quarter of the women of the country are uh, employed as workers um, in the, uh, so which shows that, and adding to this, there are even lesser females which are eligible for the social security benefits. So uh, again, a very interesting fact, and this was, I think, mentioned by uh, Dean Kathleen as well in the beginning, that how lack of access to water and sanitation facilities, especially in the schools, affect the dignity and the safety of the girls. And around 23% of the girls in India drop out of the school uh, because of this fact. Uh, when we look at the amenities or ownership, uh, looking at housing, we see that 60% of the married men report owning the housing uh, on their own, but this ratio is less so for women, which is only 22%. Um, 
usage of mobile internet is increasing by women but it remains considerably lower when compared to men and we have higher dropout uh, uh, we have seen that um, the gender parity in the justice system uh, it is not only uh, about the representation within the system but it is also about the relative safe uh, the safety net which is provided to women across the nation there is no uh, uh, doubt uh, in our minds that uh, the higher crime rate for women in india makes it extremely unsafe in many of the states uh, and parts of the country for women uh, and it is an important opportunity to uh, 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 which should be accessible and universal to women to be in a safer environment physically as well as through the justice institution which are available uh so um, along with this uh, uh when we have seen inequality of home uh, the next part of the presentation highlights that uh, it relates to back to one of the initial parts uh, uh, which we mentioned about the outcomes versus opportunities the whole debate there so outcomes as we know are the ends uh, which result Uh, you know, outcomes are the ends which have been the result of various means or the processes which relate to the access to basic opportunities. So, uh, what we have done is that we have tried to make a correlation between the outcomes, looking at the GDP of the states and. uh the opportunities uh which are there through the ranking overall uh, ranking uh, scores or the composite index and we see that there is a high correlation and the state with the high income performs better in overall ranking or vice versa we can say that the states which have higher access to basic opportunities perform better uh, results in better outcomes or have better income and thus are uh, will have better economic growth and a uh, development process so uh, th this is an in, uh, this is something which uh, is available in all, uh, many of the literature as well which shows a high correlation between outcomes and opportunities but the focus of the governments should be uh, more towards achieving universal access uh, to opportunities rather than just looking at the outcomes or the ends um another uh, uh, dimension which we have looked in the report is uh, not only uh, in addition to rural and urban disparities to where a person resides we have also look at the regional disparities uh, 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 you know dividing Latika, just yeah. just a second uh, i'm just i just add that uh, venus sir suggested this earlier when we were talking about the idea for this panel so uh, we thought of adding a few of these interpretative results and it would be great to hear his thoughts um please please carry on okay so yes uh, this has been added in the later parts as the uh, uh, the panch mentioned so regional disparities uh, we see that uh, the front runners have been dominated the front runner category has been dominated by the southern states we have five su southern states which make it into the top category uh, performing category and if we we see uh, the achievers uh, we see north east uh, eastern states which uh, dominate here uh, particularly for uh, the indices if we uh, see for education and healthcare here also we see that southern states dominate among the front runners in both the pillars whereas northeastern states they lag behind in both uh, they have their own uh, geographic we understand that they have their geographical and other um, uh, uh, geopolitical issues which makes it uh, difficult to ensure universal access but at the end of the day uh, for every citizen is equal and uh, we need to ensure that there is universal access to basic opportunities for their development at the end of the day so uh, by this uh, we the, this is the end of the findings which we have from our uh, report uh, way forward or how it's going to go forward for us and the university uh, i would like the panchu to uh, uh, the panchu would you like to take up this uh, part please yeah so i mean uh, just very quickly because we want to hear uh, our dear panelists and thank you so much uh, latika vanshika and advaita for uh, you know very comprehensively trying to present some very uh, you know uh, fragmented and uh, complex findings uh, that was emerging from our study for the purpose of this presentation for those who are looking for you know shorter presentation uh, we will also have a small presentation by authors in the evening panel where we have maitrish katak uh, nilanjan sarkar and roshan kishore um going forward um 
you know, we we mentioned this, and um, you know, earlier this was pointed by Adin as well that we do want to uh, take this forward as in you know, an index which evolves from time to time as a way of understanding dimensions of access uh, across not just social composition but also looking at different aspects where states um, and how some of the better performing states are evaluated from a more micro um, you know ethnographic lens i don't think you can i mean it's like you know you need to get both of the hands talking to each other where if you have a macro level study from an index giving us a perspective of which states are doing better in one you know for us for example punjab's performance in education was was you know in our sort of intuitive sense a surprise and we we sort of were looking back again and again in the data that there are there you know any glitches or is there something that we're missing out but that's the point you know you do want to get a sense of a, a macro uh, perspective or a bird's eye view and then uh, take a worm's eye uh, view by by visiting uh, some of these states unless and until we don't have support from the local jurisdictions and the state authorities i think becomes difficult and there's a reason why certain institutions um, have you know better network capital to to be able to tap into that but we hope that the dissemination of the study creates you know sort of that interest um we do want to capture the progress um and a dashboard has already been created where we put the raw data of the index out we will put the recordings of the presentation and the powerpoint itself so it's all going to be uh, accessible to everyone who's looking to take this feel feel free to critically analyze the results and share with our team um, professor siddhi has already done that when she was reviewing the report and her insights were incorporated so it's a work in progress it will there's no and the issues with indices indices um, i mean you always can pick up as much as you can and you have to leave a lot aside and what you leave aside becomes then a a point critical point of distinction um so there is an effort uh, taken here to get what we may consider as the best or or or, or the best possible scenario to give a sense of where we are and unless we don't do that it's like the same thing with institutional rankings uh, there are a lot of issues with the way the ranking structure is um, you know sort of designed in education for higher education institutions um, but still there is this this quest for benchmarking within uh, policy making and thought um, which which has sort of you know been the dominant part of the discourse a final point is that we do want to look at how the pandemic itself has exacerbated uh, the existing inequities uh, there has been a struggle to be able to get data um, and i would say as far as i can uh, that there is a sort of uh, you know a lack of cooperation among state authorities and also at you know at the national or uh, union level to be able to get us a sense of how states are performing across different indices and that's maybe the nature of the sense of politicizing a lot of the you know work around um, national data level collections but we hope that in the next year or two when we get a better sense of the picture uh, some of our own centers work has looked at the impact of the pandemic within education healthcare and we've been having you know working papers we've had around six papers looking at the impact of the crisis on the informal landscape of workers domestic workers street vendors uh base pickers um the the industrial workers were working on uh, subcontractual or ad hoc exploitative contracts we've done that work and ethnographically that's documented we, and it's presented also in form of video essays but we do want to get a better sense of how the macro perspective of the impact of the pandemic can be evaluated so with that we'll maybe probably probably pause in here and i would like to sort of get our panelists involved in the conversation now um in terms of the format as discussed before uh, let me you could just maybe short, stop sharing the presentation for now thank you so much and um, we'll just invite maybe first dean sudarshan share his observations and then uh, venu sir um indrineel and siddhi um 10 to 12 minutes maybe of time for your opening remarks and we have you know towards the end some time where there can be a back and forth with authors um and we look forward to your response thank you so much sir and off to you please thank you very much dipanshu and and thanks a great deal to this to the team that um, prepared uh, this access inequality report um i am uh, quite delighted to um, 
look at the report. And um, let me first say that um, um, Dean Madrowski suggested that uh, we should produce a user's guide to how to use this report. But I'd like to make a point that's a little in advance of that, which is that what uh, Dipanshu and your team, what you've done is a phenomenal contribution to the pedagogy of our university. In other words, all of the people who've been involved in preparing this report um, have learned a great deal and have learned it in a way which is much more meaningful than many of the courses uh, that we teach in a lecture format in many of our programs. So this is a kind of a learning by doing exercise. And uh, all those who've been involved in this are, um, you know, I dare say much more competent um, for having had the luck to work in this team uh, in preparing this report. Um, I'm not too, um, I don't think that uh, any government in this country will take any notice of your findings um, at all, right? Uh, now, I, I say this with some um, experience because uh, when I worked in UNDP, uh, we began, we were so, I joined UNDP because I was so excited by um, the first human development report and the articulation of um, uh, the capabilities approach by Amartya Sen. Um, and so I left the Ford Foundation and joined UNDP. Um, and so one of my major concerns was that we should produce um, human development reports for the states of India. And then I had a big argument with, um, with uh, the headquarters in UNDP because they wanted the human development report to be prepared by um, an independent set of scholars uh, and not done with the government. Uh, and uh, I argued that uh, uh, given the way in the Indian government works, um, you know, Amartya may have most brilliant ideas and so on, but nobody will take any notice of it unless he's been asked to head an official committee and produces a report that is official, right? And Amartya, of course, prides himself in saying that he's never uh, participated in any official committee um, and uh, has been, uh, you know, I don't know if he's been asked to, but he's never accepted any such government um, uh, portfolio uh, to work. Uh, so we, I argued and uh, that the report should be official. They should be owned by the different governments. Um, and um, so having won that battle, we, we had this uh, large project uh, where we started off with the, you know, Madhya Pradesh, you know, Sanket was an NGO and uh, we had uh, Sandeep Dikshit lead a team of young people working with Digvijay Singh at that time, uh, produced the first human development report for a province or a, worldwide it's the first provincial human development report uh, for Madhya Pradesh that was followed by two or three others. And then we had this project with the planning commission, which was um, uh, headed by Rohini Nair. And um, we started a, a planning commission encouraged and supported a number of states to produce human development reports. Um, so it looked very optimistic in the beginning because when the Madhya Pradesh report was stabled in the assembly of Madhya Pradesh, the opposition, which was then the BJP, uh, um, you know, jumped up and uh, attacked the government and the Congress governments of all the previous years for the sorry state of affairs that that report depicted about Madhya Pradesh. And uh, Digvijay Singh, um, you know, to his credit, stood up and said that you know the first step in tackling a problem or solving the problem is to recognize what is the nature and the intensity or the depth of the problem. And the human development report gives you a, a picture of how bad the state of affairs is in Madhya Pradesh 
no point blaming past governments and so on. Uh, we should try and do something about these results. Um, and so we then, you know, end, ended up, you know, creating one of the good things about the way the government did our human development reports is that it it stuck to the principle of independence of authorship in a sense, because they were not produced departmentally. Um, they had the imprimatur or the official status of a report, uh, but they were prepared by scholars in different states. Um, you know, Mahindra Lama worked on the report for uh, Sikkim, Jayati Ghosh did it in West Bengal you know, leading a team of uh, independent uh, scholars. So in that sense, the um, contents of the report were not uh, manipulated or biased to paint a rosy picture um, that you might expect from, um, you know, the political class might wish to have it or the bureaucracy might wish to have that. So, so those reports are, you know, have been prepared by teams that are actually independent and had this editorial independence and were also official reports. So one, the hope then was that since it's an official report tabled on in the assembly uh, and the different uh, departments would, uh, were involved, they would take notice of it. But one of the things that happened, and this often happens, um, the human development report is a means to an end. And the end really is that you have a set of policies that address the serious gaps and shortfalls that these reports produce. Now, did that happen? I'm afraid not, uh, because producing the report became an industry in itself. Um, so the, the, what is meant to be the means became an end in itself. I mean, you had some interested bureaucrats and some interested departments uh, working on it, they produce the report and it's published. Uh, and the idea that it would be followed up. Uh, and so, so what I'm going to say is that even though uh, we started off assuming that if it is an official report owned by the government, the chances of its findings and its policy recommendations would be taken seriously was belied, right? So then there's a fat chance that uh, a report that of this kind that we produce, um, you know, is going to take, get noticed. So therefore I'd emphasize that we should do these reports, but do them really because we want more and more people, uh, more and more of our students um, capable of doing this kind of thinking and analysis. Um, so it is, so if, if um, you know, none in, government shows any interest in this report. I don't see that as any reason to be disappointed. They don't show any interest in their own official reports also, right? So uh, bringing about policy changes um, and uh, getting governments to act on findings, you know, targeting where the serious shortfalls are and so on, require another set of uh, strategies. Um, and, uh, you know, reports won't do that. Um, so I'd say that therefore there is, um, uh, if you like, uh, um, uh, enormous value to the work that you do because it's a great training ground uh, for the kinds of things that we want uh, our students to learn and to accomplish because these are skills and techniques. I mean, you know, drawing inferences from data, uh, being able to produce something that uh, summarizes the findings of uh, a very large data set. All of these are very valuable and they would come into use in uh, many, many walks of life. So I must express my gratitude to you for having um, shown that, you know, by involving uh, a lot of young people, students and others, uh, and producing a, a report of this kind with, uh, with the kind of, you know, multiple uh, um, skills are demonstrated in this, including the presentation, um, the graphics, um, the summary of uh, uh, findings, all of that is, is extremely valuable. And so discussing this, um, I would see it as a very important uh, part of our pedagogy, of our, what, what we are there for. The raison d'etre of the university is this, right? So 
Um, I must thank you for that. Uh, but don't have any expectations that um, any government will um, take any notice of this. Um, I, I'm, I want to particularly welcome uh, the fact that you've intro you introduced into this. See, the, the, the approach is, is very good because you, know, you can see that the problem with the human development index is it has two outcomes, uh, you know, which is life expectancy and uh, uh, access to knowledge. Um, and then it has uh, per capita income, which is means to an end. So it kind of mixes up, um, you know, what you've been describing as, um, you know, opportunities and outcomes, right? So in the capabilities approach, it's, you know, it's, there is a well-reasoned, basis for focusing on opportunities. You have a nice uh, quote by, uh, from uh, Sen Andres uh, on it. Um, that, you know, outcomes are expected to follow, but, you know, at least you must have some equality of opportunity. And, and um, you made the same point by quoting uh, Gandhiji saying the same thing um, when we started this, uh, this session. So, Having said that, I think these um, the, we can discuss what should be the, um, the indicators, variables, what dimensions should we look at for opportunities and so on. And um, I'll end by just complimenting you for introducing justice, but also saying that it's um, very unsatisfactory um, because, you know, uh, firstly, uh, when it comes to justice, uh, I think the great majority of people in this country um, use uh, the justice system to harass uh, one another. I mean, they don't expect a dispute to be actually resolved. Uh, very often cases are filed only to harass the other side. Um, and, um, and then, you know, to continually appeal, not to accept the verdict. Um, unfortunately, the government of also has the same tendency, which is never to accept a lower court's decision uh, and to appeal it to the high court and appeal it again to the Supreme Court because you have the right to appeal. And bureaucrats think that because there's a right to appeal, if they didn't appeal, uh, they would be causing a loss to the revenue of the state and they must file the appeal. And there's a vested interest and in lobby of uh, government counsel um, who like this to happen because their earnings depend on um, governments not accepting any verdict of any court until you go all the way to the Supreme Court, no matter how many years it takes. So we are making a dysfunctional use of the justice system, right? So with the result, there is a kind of a Parkinson's law here, where if you increase the number of judges, that doesn't somehow make much of a difference to pendency rates, the number of cases that uh, keep continually keep piling up, even though you steadily increase the number of judges. So looking at the number of judges um, is, is and, and that, I think we need to look at this, you know, actually we need a much more anthropological uh, sensibility about what people do to resolve disputes. Um, now the Kaap Panchayats of uh, Haryana, which uh, Kathleen mentioned, um, get a bad name uh, because they are opposed to uh, Sagotra marriages, and it always makes the news. They excommunicate some couple, or it takes more extreme steps. Uh, but by and large, that institution has flourished for as long as it has, uh, because with respect to family and property disputes, uh, their verdict is accepted by the community, and uh, the people go to them, right? That's why they, they are there. Nobody went to those, so you don't look at the demand side. But there's a great deal of demand for non-state justice institutions in our country. Um, the supply side, you look at uh, the formal justice system. Uh, and uh, you know, recently the Chief Justice of India made a comment that this uh, uh, British inherited formal justice system uh, is out of sync with the mores and expectations of our people and that we need to revisit this. And so this may be a, a problem because when we adopted the constitution, uh, all of the draftsmen were barristers at law uh, trained in the British system uh, and no one paid any attention to uh, the fact that you might have, you know, others, you know, in India had justice systems and dispensation of justice before the British 
introduced the, the formal structure of the, the courts, right? So this is something that we need to yeah. do in the future. Um, so I'd say that therefore, and then um, looking at the number of police. Now, uh, my colleague uh, also did a report, which uh, um, you know no one takes any notice of, called the India Public Policy Report. Um, Rajiv Malhotra uh, led a team, published this report, uh, which looks at policy effectiveness. That's how he defined it of the different states and ranked the states according to policy effectiveness. And Sikkim, interestingly, um, came out on top uh, of that um, measure of policy effectiveness that Rajiv had. But one of the dimensions he had was rule of law. He didn't call it justice, he called it rule of law. And he looked at, again, um, you know, how many policemen are there for population and so on. But then there's a problem with that, you see, because you have to be more fine-tuned. Um, in, the, in, in the Northeast, um, because of security concerns, um, it's a highly uh, militarized place. Um, so you, there's a lot of investment in, in uh, police, armed police, different categories of police, um, you know. Uh, and so if you just looked at the picture and said, how many police are there for population? And we assume that, you know, the more police there are per, per 100,000 population, the more safe the population would feel. It would probably in many of these places be the opposite. opposite. Uh, the more yeah. police personnel you have, uh, the less secure the people would be, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to look at some of these look things. At this so that's all I'd say for all right. like this. But all uh, right. thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Venus, sir, please, off to you. I know you patiently waited. You're on mute, sir. You're on mute. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yeah, so thanks, Dipanchu, for uh, uh, for inviting me to give my comments. And uh, uh, I, at the outset, uh, I think the you, you've done a good job. I mean, your people your, uh, have done a good job of... Uh, beginning this exercise, uh, uh, and the the frame broadly, I I would go with the uh, I would endorse the framework that you have adopted to to assess both access to opportunities uh, uh, cap and you know capability uh, development of capacities and uh, and also outcome. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, uh, I would. Also add that there, there is, uh, as you go along the, the pantry, you must do a lot of creative, uh, you know, ref, refinement of uh, of within each of these verticals, whether it's access to health or edu access to education, access to justice, access to sanitation, basic community. Uh, it will be a great exercise for your students uh, and great learning also for your uh, university, uh, uh, for all the researchers. Uh, to, to actually, uh, uh, as you yourself said, you know, there is a there's a bird's eye view and there's a worm's eye view. I think you sh uh, it it will be a great exercise for students to actually go go down to the ground. I I'm saying this because I'm a journalist for 35, 37 years. Uh, I've only done, uh, you know, I've I've traveled extensively. I've covered 20, 30 elections. During elections, we you know go to remote uh, parts of uh, the, the country. Uh, uh, and we we precisely in a very informal sense we ask these questions, you know. So so for instance we, uh, for, for instance last say 30, 35 years whenever I go to uh, some backward districts of UP uh, or Bihar, uh, uh, my two simple questions that I ask uh, villagers or you know women in the villages or the or, or the uh, or the elders in the villages. Is how many girls went to school, say, uh, say ten years ago, twenty years ago? How many girls in your village are going now? So, I mean, anecdotally, we uh, or how many people had pakka houses twenty years ago, and how many people have you know pakka houses today? I mean, these 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 this, uh, these things. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, there have been stru structured research projects on, on these lines. Uh, you know, Devesh Kapoor and all have done uh, as part of. Uh, you know their own uh, uh, exercise of understanding uh, both access and outcomes. 
they have been doing this, uh, especially taking taking districts which are dominated by Dalits, you know, uh, dominated by backwards, uh, where there is or or tribal, where th there has been very little uh, uh, progress, uh, as it were, uh, relative to other you know uh, other districts uh, <coughs> which are dominated by the upper caste. So, I think uh, we are a very complex society. So while the framework that you have devised is a, I would say, a very good uh, starting point. But from here on, uh, you know, for, for more detailed or for more uh, nuanced learning, uh, you must go to the ground. Your students must go to the ground. I, I don't know how expensive it would be, but uh, to understand, uh, you know, the, the, uh, you know this, this, the subtext uh, of uh, our, you know, different regions, different cultures, different, uh, you know, caste dynamics. Uh, uh, like, for instance, I'm not surprised that the South comes up uh, uh, on most indicators, comes up ahead of uh, the North, North, Northern states, the landlocked states, right, as it were. Uh, part of the reason, obviously, uh, also is, as your dean uh, uh, was also pointing out, uh, if you look at the social history of the South, you know, the Tamil Nadu, etc., you know, the, the politics of social empowerment happened there in the 50s. So there's a lot less, uh, there is, of course, but a lot less uh, uh, contestation between, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for empowerment, for, for caste reservations, for, uh, you know, for, for, for state-led uh, kind of uh, 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 empowerment, uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, you'll you'll see you'll see these much more uh, intensely being contested in the north, as you as we recently saw that Nitish Kumar and you know a few uh, 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 politicians of Bihar uh, actually across the board Nitish Kumar and Tejasvi Yadav uh, uh, personally met uh, requested the prime minister for a full OBC survey. Right now, th there's a reason why such such demands don't <laughs> don't come from the south. Uh, right, so so these are some of the complex <clears throat> issues that uh, that I think you you need to sort of uh, to understand uh, maybe through surveys. You know, uh, a good way to like uh, Kathleen was talking about gender. Now I'm I'm perennially uh, sort of uh, puzzled by the fact that 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 women's participation in labor. I never understand why in India, uh, while the average may be 19 or whatever, as one of your uh, researchers pointed out. But again, there is a South versus North divide. On everything, there is South versus North divide. Per capita incomes, uh, Southern states average would be about $3,000 plus, uh, $4,000. Northern state would be at the, you know, uh, uh, about $1,000, $1,200 uh, or even below that. Uh, Bihar is even below $1,000. So, 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 so go, as per as as your researchers pointed out, there's a correlation between per capita income and other social indices. Now that is one aspect that is pure data, uh, studying correlation. But the the point I'm making is uh, it's it's important to understand why in Bihar labor participation participant ratio is four percent. I mean I cannot for the life of me believe that only four out of 100 women are actually in the labor market. Uh, so what are the other 96 doing? Now, we were told, uh, you know, 2011 census, uh, NSO, we were told that uh, a lot of uh, economists like Shurjit Bhalla and many other, uh, uh, you know, economists uh, came up with this explanation when the labor participation ratio of women was dropping. They came up with the explanation that India is progressing, becoming more prosperous. Uh, so women are actually not falling off the labor uh, force, uh, they're voluntarily falling off the labor force because they're trying to retrain themselves. So, so this was the narrative in the, in the, in 2010-11. So now I see I've, one has waited for now more than, uh, you know, 10 years. One would expect that those women who, who fell off the labor force, uh, who voluntarily, as it were, went off the labor force would have trained themselves to come back not happening actually it's falling even further so i think these are the gender puzzles you know for me i don't think any economy in the world can uh, uh, or any society whether you can 
socially progress or economically progress if if uh, uh, if you take say up and bihar you know women's participation labor force at single digit you know uh, and these two countries together are the size of america and uh, it is the consensus is that these two uh, these hindi uh, heartland stay, uh, states uh, the next 20 years of indian uh, social and economic development uh, hinges on how these states perform right there is no i mean there, there is no contestation on that so therefore i think there's a should be a special focus on understanding these states what the hell is going on here no? see south is okay south there are world there was a world bank report which says that southern demographics now you know they mirror mu- uh, much more the de- developed countries you know in terms of uh, the you know the, the age population ratio to working population but but the real the real story of india's future in terms of what do you do with the working population you know the younger demo- so called demographic narendra modi keeps talking about three d's you know demographics and demand demographics and uh, whatever you know the, the i forget what the third d no so i think i think we have to study demographics and within that gender so so what i'm trying to say dipanchu is that while your broader uh, the i agree with the broader framework but inside each vertical there is a need to f- refine uh, our learnings and and there's a need to do it uh, sometimes you know government data can come with the lag can come uh, you know depending on the government's uh, proclivities you know this government uh, reached a point where even nsso data which which india which imf multilateral agencies uh, uh, you know world world over which was india's nsso data was kind of you know considered a very stable and uh, you know very authentic uh, uh, sort of uh, in, in terms of methodology etc uh, everybody considered nsso data uh, with a lot of respect but this government came and they uh, they started doing things which kind of uh, uh, which was which also ended up discrediting nsso data also for instance they before the 2019 elections they never accepted the the unemployment <laughs> you know data which came you know in 2017 18 like uh, of course after winning the election they uh, they accepted it but what i'm saying is uh, as sudarshan said i i don't think you should bother about whether government is uh, uh, takes you seriously or not i mean nobody should bother about we should only bother about our learning uh, uh, i mean if the government did not take un undp report seriously they doesn't take its own report seriously so uh, so i think this exercise should be purely driven as a as a means for your own learning for your own researchers uh, uh, getting at the truth as far as possible uh, through uh, through various means uh, methodologies and uh, to figure where where is india headed in terms of the gandhian objective of you know access to the poor access to the you know the uh, under uh privileged access to the lower caste uh, uh so so these are these are issues which which are very much alive today so whether it's a digital divide or whether it's a access to education you know access to health uh, also f- i'll make a final point you know some of the flagship schemes of the government whether it's you know uh, low cost housing or ayushman bharat uh, you know the the insurance scheme you might want to study these uh, uh, the outcome of these uh and you'll find very interesting for instance during the pandemic the southern states performed very well in terms of the use of ayushman bharat insurance scheme because the southern states even before prime minister modi announced the scheme were doing very well they were covering about 70% of the population to private insurance also i mean the state was paying the 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 the, the, the premium but the the private hospitals were also participating in you will be surprised in up and bihar the numbers of hospitalization under the scheme were were barely in hundreds you know 800 i mean it, this is ridiculous you know for a population of uh, you know uh, uh, so for as as up and bihar are you know to uh, over 300 million and you have you know ayushman bharat uh, uh, hospitalizations uh, under that scheme at some 900 800 you know uh, i mean these are shocking statistics for me So anyway so these are uh, 
so so it has to uh, uh, i mean i congratulate you for for uh, starting this uh, uh, you can actually don't bother about what government thinks about it do solid research do some good surveys i'm telling you the media will pick, pick up your stuff and media will run with it because today everybody wants to know the truth and uh, a lot more truth is coming out of civil society initiatives uh, than from the state thank you thank you so much when you said no i mean uh, all of the observations that i think both uh, dean sudarshan and uh, you made are well uh, received uh, in fact uh, there is a sort of a way in which in which we go forward in designing our studies to have more uh, worms eye perspectives and balancing out words of view i think just just the way we'll have to see is how resources are mobilized uh, yeah. i must add i must add that even for this particular study report we had no external or internal funding and okay. uh, that 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 sort of you know creates a barrier in the way in which you, know, you can so a lot of the work we have been doing even ethnographically uh, looking at vulnerable uh, workforce groups because that's the meat of the center's work in fact in the last 5 years um there uh, we 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 try to and the, the presentation of that work often used to ask us this question um that what what actual macro standpoint you have based on which you are providing these worms i view because from a policy perspective solutions will come only from you know states or civic uh, you know bodies or or at, or at a union level so it's like you know you <laughs> if on one hand you get like a a a, a macro or oh, sorry a micro meso level like a very granular perspective on looking at the nature of issues uh, in fact most of our writings also are trying to kind of brace towards that the issue is well we have a structure we work in a certain way you give us a sense of a data or a starting point but yes i do agree i think maybe in the way we design the reportage um we can maybe narrow down on the top 3 or 4 performing states which are doing well and we are seeing and we are getting curious like i am very curious about punjab uh, in terms of looking at what what's happening with education in case of healthcare if a certain state is doing well what is basically that that they are doing well in terms of a certain metric a uh, formula um, and we can manipulate rankings as well in terms of uh, you know certainly focusing on targeted indicators and that has its own effects but uh, we also have you know in the evening a panel discussion with maitreesh um, roshan and nilanjan so that discussion itself is more on the way forward so i'm hoping we'll have some institutional collaboration as well which can help us uh, you know take the work forward but appreciate your inputs Indrilda uh, uh, who has been a mentor for in fact in the work around health uh, he was also one of our first responders on the study when an index like this was conceived i think this was 3 to 4 years back uh, when we had a discussion on our campus it was a much much small organized affair and he had given us some very useful inputs indrilda off to you and then siddhi yeah please thanks uh, dipankshu i would uh, first of all apologies because my wifi network is not working so i'm taking it from a phone my um, internet might work off so i may not be um, am i audible is it working adequately well now aapki awaaz buland hai aap boliye okay thank you so uh, yeah of course i would like to first uh, congratulate all of you latika rita vanshika advita and of course uh, dipankshu because as a researcher i have a feeling how uh, challenge what kind of challenging task you have embarked upon uh, and without like dipankshu has mentioned without much uh, resource support the pan the point that uh, the introduction mentioned about the pedagogy well, refinement it brings out i think it is hugely hugely commendable so it's not easy when you are trying to bring out uh, 58 indicators together link them conceptually uh, ground them with uh, data and then uh, you know develop a narrative we were narrative together and in such exercise the most critical part is to recognize systematically the challenges and uh, note them down 
and periodically make improvements i think you guys are making a considerable uh, progress towards a very very commendable progress uh, towards that making this uh, this is a brilliant uh, start and you are uh, absolutely spot on in your approach and uh, trying to make uh, so so Uh, thoughts i had in my mind that how this can be made better you have already mentioned that you would be taking up for instance see the conceptualization of access like all of you uh, all of us are recognizing it is not so easy it uh, access is an intermediate outcome it is not a final goal that we are bothered about uh, it is uh, so like you have also mentioned it it is one of the enable enabler at the same time access is also not at the level of outputs and inputs the systems tend to uh, measure and provide so in this complexity on one hand uh, not at the level of final outcomes which are much easier to measure and then uh, not even in the at the level of inputs and outputs you are trying to conceptualize something which is multi dimensional i think it's a it's a very uh, fairly complex challenging task i i am really uh, becoming a big fan of your work all of you uh, kudos so of course there are there are uh, methodological uh, challenges there are uh indicators that we can you can bring in there is a need to strengthen particularly alatika mentioned that you know the uh, we have more data on the demand, uh, supply side but we need to bring in the demand side absolutely there is no uh, denial of that and i'm sure with more time and resources refinements you will do that mm. uh so but you know one of the major issue and the uh, conceptualization of justice uh, uh, professor sudarshan and also uh, professor kathleen has mentioned i feel you know somewhere that needs to be linked with the um, nature of indian state uh, to very uh, the it be ordered to the class interest at one hand and also Uh, remaining grounded to the semi-feudal nature, states which have been able to move away from these two tendencies and bring out uh, elements of solidarity and progress have done well. Uh, Venu and others have mentioned traces of it. I think if you look at see your uh, that correlation, I was about to suggest that we need to look at the correlations here and look at the enabling factors like income. Uh, I think that is a big revealing story. The way Gujarat having double the income or more than double the income compared to states like Chhattisgarh or Gujarat and Haryana, uh, and doing as bad. in terms of access reveals those tendencies one being very uh, rooted into its feudal tendencies semi feudal tendencies haryana and the other being completely comported to the class interest gujarat so both of them are not able to bring about access significantly and i think that's where i would like to you know in think about bringing participation and uh, democratization of it i think we we need to and that this uh, these are critical enablers of justice uh, can we can we think of it there is a contradiction because these are uh, uh, whether uh, participation of intermediate outcome you know through participation we achieve many things huh? so i think uh, that can be one theoretical uh, le theoretical suggestion i would make uh, uh yes uh, i think uh, a lot has already been said but you know somewhere your uh, report also talks about the nature of state in major way particularly the democratization part the uh, venu has already talked about it but the kind of data we have access to it clearly shows your report cannot be done without better uh, uh, some improvements need better data 
for instance, you mentioned that National Digital Health Mission. Look at the entire nature of the state. It cannot provide us uh, reliable data on how many hospital beds it has in each district, how many specialists it has in each district, how many uh, general practitioners it has in each district, how many people it provide access to safe medicine or safe, uh, say, uh, safe uh, uh, diagnostic services. But it wants all of our uh, private information health data to be collected and collected. Huh? Good yeah. data system tells the tells a lot about the nature of state. Whether because without, uh, like Professor Sudarshan said, the experience of uh, Madhya Pradesh. Without good data, we cannot make change. Huh? So the, here we see that the state is continuously trying to use data, use information, use our personal records to be a police rather than progressively address our developmental needs. Uh, I think somewhere in the conceptualization of justice, I think we need to uh, bring in openness uh, uh, and democratization elements of it. There are other reports which bring in, so say, openness in budgetary participation. Can we bring some of those elements and uh, link them uh, in this? Uh, of course, there are many, many uh, in, uh, refinements that you would continue to do, and this will bring out a lot of policy relevance. And this is the task of I uh, think uh, research community as a whole to tell the truth. Uh, there would be a day where mm, you know this would be a benchmark to assess whether states are doing good or not, uh, and uh, access would be a critical uh, policy and uh, I think uh, parameter in policy. There would be a state which would be more responsive to such research. And with that hope and with a lots of uh, good wishes for your team, I, I would close. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Indranilda. Siddhi, you have waited uh, patiently and uh, we don't <laughs> want to uh, take any more time from you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dipanshu, for giving me this opportunity to participate in and contribute to this discussion. As Ada already mentioned in my introduction, my own research is exclusively in the area of theoretical economics, uh, where I rely largely on game theoretic analysis. So reviewing this uh, report has been a learning experience for me uh, as well. Uh, but apart from the contribution that this exercise has to the process of learning for, for us, for our students, and even if the governments uh, don't take notice of this index and completely ignore it in their policy making, I still feel that, and this has already been said, but I would like to repeat that, I feel that this uh, is still a powerful tool to hold governments accountable. And we, as part of the civil society, you know, and through the various ways in which uh, we engage with public discourse, and we make demands of the government. Uh, so we can use this index, I think, to articulate our demands and our expectations. So in that sense, I think the framework is uh, very useful and very powerful. Um, after reading the report, I have a list of remarks uh, slash questions, and uh, I'll, I'll now share those. I hope that uh, Dipanshu, you and my fellow panelists will excuse me if some of my comments or questions reflect my lack of experience with empirical analysis and the kind of methodol methodological challenges that come with it. Um, since the importance and relevance of this index has already been highlighted, um, and I wholeheartedly agree with everything that has been said, um, so I'm just going to move on. Um, the first thing that I, that I thought was, so in the report and in today's presentation as well, the discussion that motivates the need for such an index, it focuses on the unequal access that people in this country have to basic amenities, education, healthcare, social security, and justice. These inequalities, they exist across states and union territories, um, but they also exist across social groups, across rural urban space, and across genders. Um, and the analysis of inequalities across social groups, genders, and rural urban spaces is done uh, in the report by comparing various measures of access along these five pillars. But the AEI, it ranks only states and union territories by overall degree of access along the five pillars, right? Um, so to that extent, I found the name Access Inequality Index to be a bit of a misnomer because, um, and hear me out, um, the nature of the index is like that of the Human Development Index and not like that of the Gini Index, which is an inequality index. 
So um, that said, I understand that to an extent, greater access to things like amenities and secondary education translates to lower inequality and higher or higher equality of access um, across the population of a state or union territory. But ultimately, the inequality of access across states is being measured by looking at the variation in the index values um, across the states with higher variation implying higher inequality and lower variation implying lower inequality, right? The index number corresponding to any state or union territory, it tells us very little in terms of equality or inequality within the state. Um, and it can be a bit misleading because if with all the motivation, you know, we are interested in inequality that uh, of access between different groups and different genders and, you know, rural urban spaces, but the index number, it gives us information only about access. And from what I understand, the policy goal then uh, for a state with, with low rank would be to climb up the rankings or to improve their index value. Since increased access may not immediately lead to a better ranking, but just the goal could be to increase the index value. So I, I just felt that, you know, the name access inequality index, it, it might be misinterpreted as this being an index of inequality. Um, whereas, uh, you know, in, in, indices are used that way to look at inequality. So just a small note on that. Um, but I do, but I do understand that access in itself, higher access translates to higher equality. So in that sense, it also makes sense. So this was the first uh, thing. The second thing that I wanted to talk about was um, there are four ways in which access is being understood, is being conceptualized, which is approachability, availability, uh, appropriateness and affordability. And uh, but when I, I went through the list of the indicators, I find that affordability is um, not being measured by as many indicators as the number of indicators that I used to measure approachability, appropriateness and all of that. Uh, in particular, I found four indicators, uh, two for health, um, of which one of them was solely focusing on reproductive health. Um, and then there was one for secondary education, and there's a small note on that as well um, in the limitation section. And uh, there was one more for piped water. So I, I feel that um, this can be a bit of a, I mean, this is just, a, again, like I said, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of data constraints and other reasons for this, but affordability is because we are not really making a distinction between these four ways when we are saying access. And in today's era, I think affordability is a real challenge. So somehow I felt that, so for example, according to the economic survey of 2020-21, uh, India has uh, one of the highest uh, levels of out-of-pocket expenditures, which is contributing directly to high incidence of catastrophic expenditures and poverty. And this is in the context of health. I'm talking in the context of health. And about 65% of deaths in India are, are now being caused by non-communicable disease, which includes heart disease and obstructive pulmonary disease and stroke. Um, so I found that when we are looking at affordability in healthcare, we are focusing largely on uh, deliveries, the expenditure on deliveries. And, you know, I, I feel that given that 65% of deaths in India are now happening because of, you know, other kinds of diseases. And the survey also underlines the out-of-pocket expenditure for health. It increases the risk of vulnerable groups slipping into poverty. And I think NSS data, um, it, it, it has data on catastrophic health expenditure and out-of-pocket expenditure. So I was wondering if there is some way that can be also used as, because we are using uh, average expenditure per delivery as one of the indicators. So I, if, if we could sort of have more indicators which reflect affordability, I think that, that would be great. And um, also I'm not gonna talk about justice because it has already been talked about, um, but I feel that in the current form, the index does not make any distinction between public and private provision of healthcare, education, and amenities beyond the fact that state expenditure contributes positively to access. So I appreciate that. And high average expenditure made by people, for example, on secondary education, this is seen as an indicator of low affordability. But that is the extent to which we are looking at, um, you know, pub the public-private dynamic in the index. And um, 
So one could, as if one were to assume that a high average expenditure made by people, it's high because of the reliance on private sector. Maybe that would be something, but that's not very clear. Uh, the report itself points two things. Firstly, the fact that thirty percent of secondary education is uh, 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 secondary schools are private. This creates an affordability problem. And it, the report also points that urban areas rely on private sector for health services, which is linked with healthcare being less affordable than urban areas. Although it is more available, but less affordable. So there is a there is a sort of um, tension between availability and affordability the moment we bring the private sector in. And along with other literature, this suggests that relying on private sector for expanding availability and appropriateness may come at the cost of a lowered affordability. And if this is true then I, I think maybe the AI, AEI report needs a bit more nuanced take on the policy implications because um, if the monetary and physical volume of infrastructure, health infrastructure, amenities, education, if this is what measures access, just the volume in terms of money or physical volume, um, and there are several indicators of availability and appropriateness which look exactly at this volume. And if affordability indicators are very few, and there is no distinction between public and private provision, then in principle, in principle, states could expand access while relying solely on the private sector. There are several indicators that I could that I could identify. For example, access to health insurance, uh, and this was measured by households with any usual member covered by a health scheme or insurance availability of digital infrastructure, any individual who has accessed internet in last three months using any device, approachability of education, which is secondary schools within two kilometers. So there are four or five indicators that I could identify, which could be, in principle, states could rely on expanding these while, you know, completely rely, relying on the private sector. What that does to affordability does not get captured by the index. And I know this is, um, you know, I'm just talking theoretically right now because I, since I haven't done this kind of an empirical exercise myself, I'm sure there are a lot of constraints, data constraints, methodological constraints, but I thought this, um, you know, is a suggestion that I could, or, or at least this is a remark that I could share. Um, I have two more remarks. One is about education and from today's presentation as well. I understood that the reason that, uh, you know, we're calling the pillar education, but we are focusing on secondary education is because primary education seems to be taken care of already. But I'm curious, this is more a question. I'm curious, is there a particular reason for not including higher education beyond the fact that our society is already struggling with secondary education? Is there a, a reason beyond that? Um, because I feel that secondary education, because when we looked at the five indicators, that is the pillar with minimum inequality across states anyway, um, even though the access is not great, but the inequality is less. Um, and I think that while secondary education is absolutely necessary to navigate society productively in today's era, with you know all the government benefits uh, coming in the form of direct transfers uh, to bank accounts and you know bank, being a part of the finale, being integrated into the official financial uh, system has become so important. Um, so I feel that secondary education is absolutely essential, but higher education also plays a crucial role in creating opportunities for upward social mobility uh, of social economic status. And uh, in its current form, the index includes the only vocational training uh, indicator that is included is also at the school level. Um, so I was wondering if, um, because higher education, it, it has been already established that, you know, upward social mobility, and that is the point of looking at access and whether or not people have access to opportunities, because we want to give everyone the opportunity to, you know, um, better their lives and get to better, better economic outcomes. So this is just a question, is there a reason why uh, higher education was not included? And I found the source as well, I'm not sure how useful this is, but the All India Survey of Health Education is released annually by Ministry of Education, and it contains data on several important indicators by state, gender, and social groups. So maybe, you know, maybe data from there, if not, if not, uh, if we don't make it a part of the index, maybe the data from there could help um, in the, in comparing the different groups, for example, the SEST OBCs versus the genders and, you know, across genders. Uh, and the last point I wanted to make was about, because the, the report does contain a section on, on the effects of the pandemic, and the pandemic has, in fact, 
it has only exposed and deepened the inequalities, the existing inequalities, uh, you know, across the country. Um, I feel that in, in the same line of thought, uh, maybe climate change and insulation from the costs that climate change imposes is something that could be included somewhere in the analysis, if not as officially part of the index, because uh, the rationale behind measuring access is to measure the presence of processes and institutions through which the excluded and marginalized can access upward social mobility and to move out of poverty. And the seriousness and magnitude of the negative consequences of climate change has already been established. And there is a lot of literature that links climate change to poverty, right? So, uh, and climate change is an ongoing phenomenon that will continue. It will continue having a negative impact on poverty and it will continue to undermine poverty eradication policies and efforts. So in absence of adequate insulation, uh, consequences of climate change like heat waves and floods and droughts, which have become more and more frequent in India by several accounts, uh, um, these sort of place costs, larger costs on the poor who are already particularly vulnerable. And uh, these costs can come in the form of increased med medical costs or loss of property, livelihood, negative impact on agricultural productivity, and uh, also states and social groups are unequally exposed to the ravages of climate change phenomena. So if this you know, inequality of vulnerability or the measures to protect from these vulnerabilities, if this can be either appropriately measured, uh, if it can be measured, then there may be reason to in the future maybe try and improve this as part of the index, or if not, then maybe you know, do some other kind of an analysis which can become part of the report because I found that the, the second half of the report after the, after the AEI index rankings was discussed, the second part was also extremely useful. Um, so in that sense, I thought um, this could be a, a contribution to, to the process. Um, that's all that I have to say. Thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Siddhi. And uh, I'll just, before I ask Richa, just uh, to share a few of her thoughts and then uh, Latika, we have, we have some time. Uh, I must... Uh, just acknowledge uh, my gratitude to you for uh, such detailed insights that you've offered since the time we, we, we invited you to be a part of. Uh, and and uh, over the course of the next uh, you know, few months, and, and let me say that over the next year, we will maybe uh, bother you a lot with, with queries and questions. I mean, Indranilda has been a victim of that. And, uh, it would so be my pleasure to <laughs> So, so we will we will take it one step at a time. But Same here, just... Bang, so, it's a <laughs> so uh, the first the first point that you made, which is the, that's the only point where I just feel that because the naming of the index has been, I mean, as the team would know, uh, we had over a month that we have debated on this. Uh, I mean, and more than that, uh, but month I would say that our meetings were like, and to a certain extent, sometimes the conversation was very heated. <laughs> why we are calling this. But as, I mean, I borrow from what uh, Indranil um, mentioned about access in its own conceptual basis being an intermediate enabler. And the question that often comes then is, you know, intermediate enabler of what? Uh, you know, what are you, what is the, and I think it's because maybe as an individual or as a collective or as a group of uh, people. I'm not just talking about the educated class, and I distinguish between the educated class, and the intellectual class, as you know, uh, Baba said did in that sense. Uh, but somewhere you would find that uh, our ten our tendency to think in a consequentialist frame uh, is so uh, normatively embedded in every you know thought process that we want. Uh, what is the subsequent effect or consequence of what you are trying to measure is something that overrides everything else rather than saying, you know, what you're trying to do. So at some point of time, you were thinking of calling it the state of access, you know, when you're talking about state of access, but then, you know, a lot of times the question would have come, okay, where are you talking? I mean, if this accessibility to these happen, then what, what next, you know, what is going to, to help this, a for a certain individual population to achieve. And so somewhere we had to embed this in a established discourse where in fact, even when you were uh, you know, responding to the other observations, you were saying that you know, uh, education for achieving a certain sense of status equality uh, 
uh, whether it's higher education, others. So there is that tendency to link, and I think that distinction is is vital. But I think we can do a better task in terms of maybe explaining that more as we go forward. But you know, at the same point, I think there are certain times where certain silences speak louder than words, and then they are, you know, words themselves that may fall short. Um, on the four A's that you have mentioned, I think that's something which we have discussed internally as well, and I think Richa Latika would 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 sort of bring that in about affordability and approach. Actually, the 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 frame of these four A's is prevalent in the healthcare uh, policy discourse, and we've sort of derived that in context to talking about because uh, Latika would remember this. I was very very uh, you know concerned that this will be a bone of contention where we'll be presenting the work on how we define access becoming an overriding and somewhere we felt that that should not you know sort of affect everything else that that the index has done and over going forward i think this will be brought about uh distinction between public and private higher education climate change and all these points are are excellent uh, anecdotes i'll i'll just say this before i pass it on to the team to respond our effort is that going forward, each pillar becomes an index report by itself. I'll be honest. That access of access to education becomes by itself like a sub part which has an independent, you know, body of work. And then there's a team of five or six people who are just working on access to education, access to justice. We need, you know, we need jurists, uh, and we also need, you know, policy level applied practitioners or those who can look and better understand, you know, how we uh, sort of conceptualize this. Um, at the same time, access to healthcare, you know, in the Nilgas, I think observations that we got, we got a very, very good sense of how we can, you know, do better. Uh, technology is a big, big lacuna, which is why we have a separate panel discussion today, which looks at technology as, you know, as a, as a separate uh, point uh, of looking at access to digital, digital access. So Ikriar's team has been very kind in helping us organize that. So with that, maybe just let me ask Richa and uh, Latika to very quickly share their observations and then we'll bring this to a close. Um, uh, sir, if you, in case you need to make a move, Venu sir, uh, please uh, proceed. I'll just let, keep it. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, we are, you're on mute, sir. You're on the mute. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, no, I'll... Uh, uh, <laughs> It was very uh, heartening to to see that this exercise uh, that you uh, you've conducted. Uh, uh, as somebody said, you need to. Uh, I'll just make one last point before leaving. You need to actually. You need to build civil society pressure with uh, with such research and outcomes of such research. I think it's uh, that's that's very important. P people should uh, people should actually. Uh, should know, uh, should even at the political level, people should see what you're doing. Uh, and and this is purely I'm um, just my observation. You know, you should <clears throat> you should also engage with the various social and political groups after you finished this these studies and after you refine uh, as, as you as you go along refining it. Uh, I think you should engage with younger members of parliament, younger you know people who are. Who are serious about uh, about governance? So, I think you you need basically try to build a coalition of uh, of uh, people, uh, academics, media people, you know, young MPs, young MLAs. I'm broad. I think this will help your research a lot. I, I think at this point, I'll I'll I'll, I'll make. Yeah, it. no, no, and thank you, it. sir. And one of the instruments of that is we need your support to do that as well. And I think I must uh, acknowledge that the wire and scroll both. In fact, wire mm -hmm. my association has gone for like seven, six to seven years. Um, in that sense of writing for the platform has always encouraged a lot of the work that we've published. But we also look forward to the dissemination of the study through the platform in the ways that we can. Our own work in terms of reaching out to different stakeholders. I think that will start from the time we finish this workshop, incorporate a few suggestions, and mm. you know present the findings of this. Uh, Yamini from CPR, uh, you know, is one person who is supposed to be here, but we will sort of also have a conversation there to present the work. The more inputs we get, the better it is. But thank you, sir, and um, I'll let thank you, you sort of take yeah, take yeah. your time. Yeah, thank you, and uh, Richard, please thank you. you. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, thank you, Dipanshu, and thank you all the panelists for their wonderful observation and, and comments. And thank you, Siddhi, for, for such a thorough review. I think a uh, lot of good questions and it does you know, uh, sort of instigate us to think a little more on how we have sort of designed our indicators and sort of, you know, in, in the choice of indicators that we have selected. I start from uh, your last comment on, you know, um, looking at the uh, climate change and how it does uh, affect the quality of life. I think some of the indicators that I think we, we could like probably look at looking at the like air quality or the water quality and, you know, also looking at how the number of disasters in the states and UTs have sort of affected the quality of life. And I think the point well taken and it does have effect on, you know, how uh, some of the inequalities does persist in the states. So I think going ahead, we'll, we'll uh, definitely bring in some of these indicators. In terms of, uh, you know, looking at the affordability, I would say that, you know, as a team, we, we uh, I mean, it, it, we took like, you know, uh, months to uh, sort of come out with a, a set of indicators, but because of the lack of data, like, you know, some of the uh, indicators that we did want to capture was how much does it, uh, you know, cost to actually get the um, justice or approach to the court, like how much does the charges involve, but given the unavailability of data, uh, your observation is uh, bang on that, you know, we have very limited number of uh, indicators that is looking at the affordability. But uh, I think going ahead, we can we can definitely include uh, one of the indicators that you pointed out looking at the catastrophic expendi uh, expenditure on the catastrophic health. And I think that there is a merit in, in including that indicator. But obviously, like we wanted to look affordability across the indicators, but because of the, you know, lack of data, we have, but uh, but obviously we'll also make few of the comments that we have sort of sort of missed out in in this report. Then on the uh, looking at the secondary education and why not higher education. So as you rightly pointed out, that primary education is already you know taken care of in India. So we wanted to firstly look at like you know how secondary education, how are some of the indicators performing. Uh, you know, the states are performing in terms of the secondary education and then probably in the uh, year ahead, in the next year report uh, where we design, we want to take up how, you know, the states are performing in terms of some of the indicators looking at higher education as well. But this year we wanted to uh, just, just measure uh, some of the indicator that is looking at secondary education because uh, I think first uh, one step at a time. So I think primary is taken care of. And then we want to look at, you know, how states are performing at the secondary education level. So that is, I think, one of the reasons that we thought that, you know, we will we'll just restrict ourselves to the secondary education. Then um, I think in terms of the title of the paper, as the Panshu pointed out, we, we have like debated a lot about it, uh, you know, what the in, uh, title of the report should be. And um, I, I think as a reader, I, I do understand that the title can sort of, you know, uh, sort of mislead or misrepresent, but uh, I feel that the way we wanted to look, look at inequality was how, how unequal the states are or how uh, is the persistence of inequalities in terms of accessing uh, these, uh, some of the, um, you know, uh, uh, amenities and Richard, I think we have lost you. Uh, okay, let me just maybe ask uh, Latika to come in and we can, yeah. Latika, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, Latika, I think maybe you can go ahead and uh, I will let Richard I think, come join back. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, all the panelists, and uh, for your valuable inputs. And uh, adding to first, to, without breaking the continuity, um, uh, adding to what Richa has already mentioned in terms of uh, you know the access uh, uh, dimension. The core of the paper definitely is uh, looking at the access 
and uh, the findings itself as the panchu mentioned you know uh, leave it to the interpretation of the reader whether there is inequality there or equality and how uh, you know the scores uh, depending on what is the score performance uh, how you put it uh, in terms of the uh, equality paradigm uh, so coming to uh, the question uh, where you know uh, looking at um, the public versus private uh, uh, sorry am i audible yeah so looking at the public versus uh, private uh, uh, comparison uh, so definitely uh, when we were looking at indicators say for example healthcare itself uh, uh, we were uh, we had few indicators which included private healthcare uh, uh, but since um, you know, india being a welfare state and we are looking at uh, the responsibility of the government in uh, providing uh, basic amenities or basic services to um, uh, uh, to to the citizens uh, because of that a uh, role of the government itself we thought that uh, we should include uh, first and more focus on the public institutions or the government uh, uh, services uh, rather than private uh, institutions um, private institutions also uh, the data uh, is uh, very dynamic in nature say for example the number of deaths in the um, uh, given in the private sector they change rapidly uh, uh, you know in uh, especially in case of the covid scenario uh, the private sector beds addition or uh, uh, you know deletion of the beds have been very uh, dynamic and taking that data itself was very difficult so we we have uh, uh, you know limited ourselves to public sector which is more sort of uh, stable in nature and uh, not uh, very responsive to the changes now and then so, uh, so it was easier to make a comparison and even in the uh, future versions when we do a time series analysis or uh, you know longitudinal analysis between various uh, years indexes it will be helpful to see the public sector growth itself because we are targeting at the policy see recommendations here um so but a point definitely there is because of uh, we have made the commentary that you know because of the predominance of private sector in education and uh, healthcare because, which affects affordability a lot it is very important to look at those indicators and uh, maybe in the next versions you know we are open to include uh, the private sector more as well um then uh, to your first uh, uh, comment on the out of pocket expenditure uh, so we do have the medical expenditure uh, on the yeah we losing you latika Yeah, sorry, we were losing you a second. Uh, and we have all access to uh, health insurance, which is a major part in terms of affordability because it is the greatest developed country. It is under the ambit of the government free healthcare. So that is. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to circle back to Richa Amidi. Richa, you had some finishing uh, thoughts because, in the interest of time, we'll have to close in next five minutes as well. Uh, no, so I was uh, talking about the title, which I think uh, Latika did continue, and uh, I feel uh, all the comments that was made by Siddhi, we would definitely, you know, would want to incorporate in the next year report. And uh, yeah, I I don't think I have anything else to add apart from what Latika has already said. Uh, so yeah, I mean I, we'll we'll definitely I think reach out to Siddhi in in the next year report building exercise, and I hope uh, she won't uh, <laughs> mind sharing some of her thoughts that she already did. i would be happy to help the panchu is it okay if i just respond very quickly to one yeah 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 take your take your I time thought, please we have a few I minutes there was just a little bit of a misunderstanding uh, i wasn't trying to say that you should include the private sector indicators as well in fact i love the fact that you focus on the more stable ones as you say the more stable the more accessible and affordable indicators which is through the government sector my only issue was that some of these indicators may potentially include uh, the private sector's role as well which could then by states be used to push up the access uh, 
while coming at the cost of uh, you know lowered affordability which will not reflect in the index because the number of affordability indicators are few that was my point i appreciate that you have taken state expenditure as something which contributes positively uh, and out of pocket expenditure as something that contributes negatively um, just uh, one point on the out of pocket expenditure you have included one but i thought that was only for the deliveries which was only for reproductive health mm. so i wanted i i was suggesting you can possibly look at it for the measure Mm. Um, sorry. Apologies from our side uh, because uh, there is an updated table of indicators. Uh, okay. This table, which uh, report which we had we had shared with you earlier, uh, okay. has those uh, indicators missing. Yeah. But those have. I thought so. I thought so because I was going to say next that the report I have has fifty five indicators, and today you said there are fifty eight indicators. Mm. So what are these extra yeah, indicators? I'm very curious. Yeah. So yeah. I'll I'll look yeah. at the updated one. Yes. So definitely, and I think in. Couple of days, the updated list would be there because th those went in. A, it's a sort of a, a, a editorial mistake from our side. Uh, apologies for that confusion. Yes. Uh, and I just want to add to one of the other uh, questions which you have on uh, why not a focus. I mean, uh, we have very few affordability indicators. Definitely, yes, I agree on that point. Uh, but many of the indicators, uh, you know, uh, though we have written right to write and map them to the dimension, but many of them are overlapping. So, for example, even when you uh, look at uh, injustice, say, for example, why we have taken legal aid institutions, which are mainly uh, looking at at providing affordable justice at the rural uh, or in at the village level so we can put that in the affordability uh, you know dimension as well so th that mapping itself you know uh, we've tried to do it as much possible uh, but uh, definitely a point which we need to note and highlight that some of the indicators where there is overlapping we need to ma mention affordability as well thank you so much i hope we have addressed all your questions uh, and on the sustainability <laughs> part you know we began uh, with the indicators which were related to climate as well so for example we had access to uh, you know uh, solid waste management services by the government picking up the waste collection which also is an important criteria uh, but then uh, because you know uh, having state level data which you know do justice to the definition of access itself uh, then you know we had to limit ourselves and reduce the number of indicators we had uh, so uh, the core again i would just like to mention of the report and the analysis is the access and the dimensions of the access which we have taken and that is how we have chosen the indicators definitely we can take a lot many indicators and how we define opportunities but it is just this one angle of opportunity which we are taking thank you so much. thank you for the very detailed uh, yeah. <laughs> and we will continue talking so yeah yeah let, i think that's that's what uh, yeah and so i think on the point that you've mentioned about just a clarification on the type i think that's a, that's a point well uh, taken i in fact feel that uh, we can do slightly so just to just to uh, also uh, inform our viewers the the draft of the of the report that's available on the website we mentioned it very clearly it's a working uh, uh, paper in in current work in fact the workshop for us was that uh, stage of input for a public deliberation exercise to incorporate some of the feedback we received and we will update this in the next uh, few days on the raw data and the master file i think that will that's a process which will i feel keep happening there's so many back and forth and advaita and i think vanshika would would know um, but i think this is now uh, for us from our end at this stage what we wanted to do was present what we felt was in confidence the most of what we had to write and say in terms of our findings uh, based on what indicators were chosen and uh, as we go forward in conceptualizing and doing slightly better to add more details uh, as and when required uh, we will uh, reach out to uh, some of you individually and have consultative dialogues um, uh, uh, but for now i think because in the interest of time and we have another panel starting uh, we'll bring this to a close uh, i would sincerely like to thank team sudarshan for patiently sitting out and listening to all of us um, and uh, to dr siddhi uh, for your uh, deeply insightful comments and i'm so glad that i sort of we decided to reach out to you uh, because uh, there was uh, you know i was not sure who we could reach from within there's so many economists on campus but who would <laughs> 
be uh, uh, you know a, a person who we could just get some thoughts from uh, based on the work that's been produced and uh, to finally to indrininda for all, for all his support and unconditionally investing that faith in us that we can uh, periodically continue to progress <laughs> thank you so much and thank you thank you ajay ji we can Yes, sir. We can stop the live.